title of this sermon is called The Three Greatest of the Old Testament. Go to Ezekiel 14, 14. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. So Israel is going to get judged. Uh, Israel was judged. Judah now, Jerusalem is going to get judged. And, um, and um, he's saying that these three, Noah, Daniel, and Job, who he's listed here, uh, would deliver their own souls by their righteousness. That these are God's superstars, inner circle of the Old Testament saints. Not putting down the other saints, Abraham, Father of Faith, Moses, we'll talk about them. But these three, God picked them. So I'm not going to argue with God. He picked these as the, as the greatest of the Old Testament. And we're going to look at some, some reasons um, why uh, today. Uh, but let's go ahead and give some context. Uh, it's kind of like two sermons in one. It's like a sermon on Ezekiel and judgment, and then we're going to talk about the three. Because we're going to go through the whole chapter 14. And just, just to kind of give you some context. It's just such a good chapter. Um, so first one. Um, then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart. That's where the idol starts. So the sin starts is in your heart, which is why you need to guard your heart, enlarge your heart. You know, out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. The idols are in the heart. And put stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired at all by them? Question mark. <laughs> okay, that's the word of the Lord saying, speaking. That's Jesus, uh, God, speaking through Ezekiel. You know, thus saith the Lord. Verse 4, Wherefore, speak unto them, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet, I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh, according to the multitude of his idols that here's why he does it that i may take the house of israel in their own heart because they are all estranged from me through their idols basically god's like i'm letting these false teachers teach to hook those that have bad hearts same reason today he lets false teachers stay alive and preach and teach to hook those that have bad hearts that are off okay the devil has many hooks, and uh, your just heart needs to be off just a little bit for one of those hooks to finally stick. Verse 6, Wherefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me, and setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. And I will set my face against that man, and will make him a sign and a proverb, and will cut him off. That means death, death penalty. That's not excommunication, that's death. Cut him off from the midst of my people, and he shall know that I am the Lord. So people start dying. He's like, you're going to know I'm the Lord. Okay, Israel, Israel got judged. Ezekiel uh, is, is warning Judah and Jerusalem at the same time uh, as, uh, as uh, Jeremiah. And Daniel had already been taken captive. Okay, so if you know the timelines of Ezekiel, if you can review that of when he was preaching. He's a contemporary. There is actually technically like after Jeremiah, but they're a little overlap. But he's at the same time as Daniel. Israel was judged. Some of the Jews were already in Babylon, and people still aren't repenting. That's why he's the after Armageddon preacher, okay? Afterwards, he's the one to study there. Jeremiah is for before the full Armageddon, okay? But he's the afterward guy. And uh, he's like, I'm going to cut him off, and then you're going to know I'm God. Verse 9, and if the prophet be deceived, he that hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. And I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. That's in New Testament. That's in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's our old memory scripture. If you love not the truth, God will send you a strong delusion. And here he says, I've deceived that prophet. So who's deceiving Joel Osteen? Uh, who's deceiving the fake street preachers? 
Who's deceiving the other ones? Well, first it was their own heart and the idol. Then the devil got in there, and God said, okay, you don't love the truth. I'm now deceiving you. So what I've said it many times. What's worse than being deceived by the devil? Oh, being deceived by God. <laughs> You're never getting out of that. <laughs> you can't cast that devil out because devil ain't there. That's God deceiving them. God himself would have to lift that off of them. That's why a lot of those false teachers, false prophets are reprobate. I have deceived him. That's heavy. And I will stretch out my hand upon him, and I will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. And verse 10. And they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. Oh, no, I thought it'd be less. No, you're both going to hell. You follow those false teachers, you follow those goofballs, sin enablers, letting women behind the pulpit, letting faggots behind the pulpit, prosperity preachers, Catholic, you know, you know you're both going to hell. You're both going to hell. Absolutely. That, that's what it says. It's going to be Shelby as that. Maybe one goes to a lower pit of hell, but do you think the people in hell actually care? It's not like that old silly quote, ah, oh, I stubbed my toe. Oh, I stubbed my toe. If it makes you feel any better, I stubbed my toe too. Guys burning in hell is like, I feel a lot better that Hitler's lower than me. That, uh, you know, the Pope's lower than me. No, you're burning in hell. You're not thinking about the, you think whatever level of hell you're in, you think that's the lowest level. Trust me, you think that's the lowest level. You would be shocked to even know that there's a lower level. Okay? The guys down there with the devil at the very bottom pit of hell, they ain't thinking about anybody in hell above them. They probably wish everybody else was as low as them. Because they're such sick rubber baits, you know? All the faggots are in the lowest pit of hell. All the mean false prophets are. But hell's hell. Hell's bad no matter what. Fear the Lord, don't backslide. Um, verse 11. Uh, that the house of Israel, that, here's why, Here's why I'm going to kill people. Here's why it's same judgment for both of them. That the house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, saith the Lord. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying. Now, now we're setting up this, this, this context here of, of our, our big famous three here. Um, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then I will stretch out mine hand upon it, and will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cast and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, God's three favorites, who he chose, who he named, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. By their righteousness. In Deuteronomy it says you do the works of the law, then you are righteous. Okay? Now, obviously, we're, we need the blood of Jesus, which makes us and gives us power to live righteous by the grace of God. In Old Testament, it says by their righteousness, only they would live. Only, only, only them. Um... If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land, and they spoil it, so that uh, it be desolate, then no man may pass through because of the beast. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, they only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. So he's kind of repeating himself. He's, he's bringing four judgments, so he's going to go through it four times here. Um, you know what, you can read that part later. From 14, 15, 18, 20, 21 uh, is where we're going to go. That he's repeating it over and over again of the judgments. And he names them again in verse 20. Though Noah and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. Uh, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my four sore judgments upon Jerusalem. And that's four judgments in Revelation, four judgments in Matthew 24. The four judgments, here they are. The sword, that'd be World War III now. The famine, you think inflation's bad, wait until food shelves are empty. The noisome beast, wild foxes coming in and killing your stuff. Wild uh, dogs, pit bulls, loose, running around, killing little kids. But we'll have a big adoption, I can't say the word agency, a big adoption church after World War III, absolutely. The pestilence, COVID 2.0, to cut off from it man and beast. Yet behold, God always gives some good news at the end. 
lot of bad news, but here's the good news. Behold, there shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you, and ye shall see their way and their doings, and ye shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem. <laughs> You'll be comforted by that. And the remnant will be comforted that the evil is finally judged. That's what that's saying. Uh, that I have brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I have brought upon it. Who caused World War III? Uh, God. God decided, finally, I'll let the Illuminati pull Putin's strings to shoot nukes, or maybe Biden's strings to shoot nukes first. Who knows which one will shoot first, okay? And they shall comfort you when ye see their ways and their doings, and ye shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done it, saith the Lord God. He's never just judging and killing people for like fun or for whatever, excuse me. No, it's for, always for a reason. It's called sowing and reaping. The incorrigible youth just get stoned because, no, Matthew 15, Jesus said, because he's a punk, that's why. There's always a reason why. So these are the three greatest in the Old Testament. That was my first sermon. Now we'll get into the one I have all the notes on. <laughs> these three. They have many things uh, in common. And I want to just give five before I go into them individually uh, about them. Uh, the point number one, all three of these guys were saved by the grace of God. They were all called to their specific role, their calling by the grace of God. They all endured, and they endured a lot. Job endured a lot. Daniel endured a lot. Daniel was a eunuch, never did get married. Noah's building a boat, teased, preaching for 120 years. Getting they endured all by the grace of God. That's why they're the three. So we're going to talk about some things they did, yes. But the foundation of the things that they did, the foundations of the things that you do, is because of the grace of God. So that's why they're really there. That's the number one. Never forget that. Okay? The second reason is they all obeyed all the commandments, statutes, and judgments. They were fully obedient to the word of God. To be righteous, you had to be obedient. Number three, uh, they had no sin that we can see. No sin that we can just point out. Noah did not get drunk on purpose. Daniel didn't sin at all. He was even flawless, the Bible says. Okay, He was part of the sins of the nation, of course. And Job multiple times says he's perfect. And we'll read today, God said he didn't spoke, speak bad. What did Moses do? Hit the rock? What did Jeremiah do? Complain? What did David do? Adultery? These guys all ended up being great men of faith. Okay? I can't quite put my finger on Abraham, but I have one I'll share later in the sermon. But I mean, these three, I, you don't see anything off. Yeah, anything. As soon as you know Noah didn't get drunk on purpose, you don't see anything with Daniel, Job, not, you don't see anything. About the only guys I could possibly think that would give them a run for their money is Elijah and Enoch. But they're not on the earth anymore. God took them up, you know? I mean, they talk, took them up, the hard preachers. So these three are, the, they're like, I'm, I'm going to study them. I'm going to dig in deeper. I preached a whole sermon on Job. I still get more stuff out of it. Um, number four on my list, they all suffered extreme isolation and pressure. Extreme isolation and pressure. And that much isolation, you need God. A lot of pressure. Number five, uh, more reasons that we don't know. <laughs> okay, we're not, I'm not a know-it-all pastor. We don't know it all. God knows a few more reasons why they're in his inner circle of three. God knows why. We'll find out in heaven. I just know they're there, so I preach it. I believe it. All right, first Noah. Go to Genesis 6-5. Noah the shepherd. He's always known as the builder and the preacher, but he was a shepherd too later. He raised them up when he rebuilt the earth. He didn't build the first city. 6-5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That means there's a lot of reprobates there, because that's the mind of a reprobate. Every imagination, only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, 
both man and beast, the creeping things, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, so God spoke to Noah, verbally, audibly, louder than I'm speaking, that he would never forget. He speaks to him, may have been the first time in his life, I think it probably was. The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with all with the earth. Yeah. Little little side note. Um, Methuselah. Uh, what was his name? It meant it will begin, or the judgment will begin, and the day Methuselah dies, the day the rain started coming down. So that's why he wasn't in the boat. <laughs> It lines up year by year if you look at the year one. So God spoke to him. When God really speaks to you, you know it. There is no doubt in your mind that it, it, it's 100%. And the one time God audibly spoke to me is the word Philadelphia. And I have not been disobedient to the heavenly call. Um, so verse 9 says he was perfect. What does perfect mean? It means following all of God's commandments. How do you know God's commandments? Um, Adam taught him to Seth. Let me back up. Jesus taught him to Adam in the garden. How's he going to have a son and not teach him the commandments? Jesus taught Adam in the garden. Adam taught Seth. Seth taught, Enoch, you know, down the line to Enoch. He's alive when Enoch's not alive. Enoch's teaching the whole world, preaching super hard. This is the book of Jude. Okay? Teach Methuselah to Lamech to Noah. So he got taught it and he followed daddy's teaching and he believed what they said about creation. And they had lots of evidence that was there. Tons of evidence. Okay? Uh, he, he knew. Um, uh, yeah, take some notes, big girl. Or one of you take notes. Notes are good to take. So he, didn't, he knew not to do adultery, not to do murder. He knew the first polygamist was a double murderer. He, he knew that out of Cain's line. Okay? He knew these things. So, you know, if you think you have pressure, or if you think the early, the early church had pressure, or really the church in Iran today, you think they had pressure today and loneliness, I think that's nothing compared to Noah. <laughs> Noah only had seven. You know? He had seven. Maybe Methuselah was alive, you know, from my understanding, the same day the rain came down for sure. But he only had seven. Okay? I mean, the only one with more loneliness and pressures is Job. And we'll talk about him later. All these others, Abraham had a community. Apostle Paul had a community. Moses had a community. These guys, even, they had communities. Daniel had a community. This guy and Job are like alone, you know, and Job really alone. So he, he had that going there. And the New Testament says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So he preached like Jesus preached. He preached like Enoch preached. He sat under Enoch's preaching growing up, hard preaching. He preached like John the Baptist, preached the way we're preaching. The way we're preaching, preaching of righteousness. Same holiness message that we do on the streets every week. God's commandments and judgments than the grace of God. Like John Wesley said, 90% law and wrath and judgment, 10% love, grace, mercy. Uh, most only know him as an ark builder, but he was also a preacher. He was also a homeschooler principal. Mm -hmm. He was also a disciple maker. And after the flood, he was the head civil judge of the world. He was the head civil judge. It was a theocracy. It was a theocracy through the patriarchy. Started with patriarchy, later through judges, then kings, and then priests. Okay, and then Jesus Christ, king, priest, together. And um, um, you know, another huge thing is that you know, 99% of Christians, you know, quote Christians, won't do today. 99% of parents won't do today is he cursed and shunned. It was a hard shun, not a soft shun. We can come back. He cursed and shunned his own son, Ham. See, Ham did a sin of reprobation. Ham raped his mother. Incest and rape are, reprobate, are reprobation sins. If they do a sin under reprobation, they need to be shunned. Okay? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, all the reprobates seem to be shunned by the whole church and by society, preferably executed by society, the shunned by society. And this is more proof that rapists are reprobate. More proof right there because he reprobate. He didn't. He said, "No, you're out of the community. You're gone. You're out." He wasn't just going to let you know Canaan, the, the the child that was raised from that rape, be raised around there. He cursed Canaan. Okay, and I'll get. I, you can you know. Or you guys know the teaching, but if you're on YouTube, you can call me, and, and I'll break it down to you. Okay, you know, as far as we know from the record, uh, the Babylonians were sent in to destroy Jerusalem, and it says raped our women. Who sent? Who sent them into Jerusalem? God. God sent them in there. So you could say they deserved it. Well, there's a strong one. Did any of these Babylonians get saved? No. The Bible doesn't show any of them ever getting saved. Did Nebuchadnezzar get saved? No. Was Nebuchadnezzar a rapist enabler? Yes. He permitted his armies to rape and pillage. Okay? He never got saved. Just because they said a few things right in Daniel doesn't mean he never got saved. God just used a wicked nation to judge another wicked nation. Does it all the time. And so uh, let's go to chapter 9, verse 24. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. Okay, he, 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 he had shamed him, took his mom to try to take his position, take his place. And he said, Cursed be Canaan. That's the proof right there. He didn't curse Ham. That would make no sense to have the sins of the son go to the father. No, that was the child that God showed Noah through a word of knowledge that his wife was pregnant with that baby, Canaan. Cursed him. Otherwise, you're going to be a Calvinist. How else are you going to answer that scripture? I mean, but just born, just just born, born to burn, and everything else like that. I, I believe he had a choice, and it didn't matter. He just he turned. Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And they were the Canaanites did serve later. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. It's a long time for a judge to live. And all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Shunning and discipline is what real leaders do. Maybe, uh, just maybe, that's why Abraham's not on this short list here. It took the prodding of his wife, a woman, for him to kick out Ishmael the bully. Because it's hard to rebuke your own kid. And God hates bullies. And God said Isaac is the seed, the blessed seed. And he didn't make that choice, but his wife had to prod him. Who knows how long Sarah put up and watching that? Three months, six months, she held her tongue until she finally spoke up and did something. Well, thank God she wasn't like Lot's wife, who we talked about last week. Okay? Who should have spoke up and didn't. And so, you know, out of, and by the way, out of Ham's line comes the faggots, Babel, and the giants. Again, that all comes out of his line. Okay? Bunch of cursed reprobates. A tree is known by its fruit. So if a, repro, so a reprobate would produce reprobate fruit. Fags. Babel. That, that main leader, he's a reprobate. He was a, has restarted cities again. Thought the state was above God. That's, a, that's blasphemy the Holy Spirit. And the giants, all giants are reprobate, every one of them. So, you know, a percentage of the Pharisees were reprobates. And Jesus said, your disciples are going to be twofold children of hell. And the Roman Catholic religion is part paganism, part Judaism, which is Pharisee, and part Christianity. And they are a twofold child of hell. They are worse than the Pharisees. Yes, they are. And so that's what these reprobates produce. All right, let's go on to Job now. Job chapter 1, verse 1. Everybody knows this one already. So I'll just, I'll just read it while you're flipping there. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So if someone's really perfect, they fear God and they hate evil. And if you hate evil, you're, you're getting close to perfect. You can hate evil but not fear God, that's a problem. You can fear God but not hate evil. That's a problem. 
And in this church, we will pastor that out of you, disciple that out of you, and over time, you will hate evil like you're supposed to, and you will fool God like you're supposed to, and then you're walking in perfection. And God said he was perfect. And in verse 8, he said he was perfect again. And so God let him be tested, and you will be tested. And I personally think that none will ever be tested as hard as Job was tested. Not even the martyrs today, not even people that have had their families, half their families killed in Nigeria and the wicked bad stuff and all that. Yeah, it, it, not only really anybody in an earthly perspective like Job, like Job did. Only Jesus Christ on the cross. He's the only one that passed Job in suffering, and that's Jesus Christ on the cross. Not Abraham, not Paul. None of those guys. Okay, here, let's go to the list. Job was rich, and then he lost all that. Job was a civil judge, and then he lost all that. Job was very healthy, and then he lost all that, and in extreme pain, where he had to take a pot shirt and use it as a scraper to scrape his boils on his head, the top of his feet, his genitals, his back, everywhere. Right above the eye, the eyelid, all up in there. Just pain. He had kids, then, then lost them. And you could definitely possibly deduce very strong that his daughters were actually kidnapped and who knows what happened to them how wicked is that you know uh, you know uh, or killed uh he had a community respect from the other wise men from the spiritual men he was respected he lost that he lost that and then one of the worst ones which we'll talk about here in a moment go to chapter 2 verse 6 one of the worst of them all that would really break a man's heart. That we read it kind of fast sometimes. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thy hand to but save his life. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took a pot shirt to scrape himself wherewithal. Withal. And he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Imagine your wife says, die. Die, honey. Wow. Heartbreaking. It's a different bond with a husband and wife than with the children, than with your spiritual brothers, than with your money, your civil judge rule. No, this is a whole other level. This wife used to respect him. This wife used to love him, and now she wants him to die. They rip your heart out. You know? So just like Noah rebuked and shunned his son, Job rebuked his wife. Didn't shun her. Didn't need to. It wasn't a sin unto shunning. He rebuked her. Most men can't do that. Can't rebuke their wife. And they wonder why she wears the pants. I don't like rebuking my wife. I don't have to do it right like once every two years. <laughs> it's, been, it's been every three years. You know? It's not very often. It's more like correction. I rebuke. It's a correction, though. If, it, if it's off biblically, I'm not, I don't rebuke my wife if she made some food that didn't turn out good. I don't care. I don't focus on the minors. Who cares about, you got to mess your kids up focus on the minors. Why don't you focus on the majors? If it's something major, then it's like, well, I mean, part of the congregation is my wife. I am her pastor. Hello. Why would I teach you to do anything differently? So Job rebuked his wife. And um, most men can't do that. And uh, that's one thing that makes him a real man. Besides his pushing through the suffering, is being able to rebuke his own own wife, and you can sandwich rebuke that. You can you can you know the sandwich rebuke. I love you. You're doing good, but boom, and it's because I love you, and that's why. That's fine. Do the sandwich rebuke on your kids. Do the sandwich rebuke on the side. Do it that way if you need to. On the streets, I don't think so. I'm just gonna rebuke them. That is wicked. And it's a problem with the church world. They flip flop the two. They're all super mean and harsh to their wife and kids. And then down the streets, they're like triple sandwich, you know. It was like a little tiny rebuke in the middle. Some of you might be fornicators. <laughs> you know, they're like all sissified backwards. So 
you know, he didn't shun her and he did not divorce her. He salvaged her. And they had more babies later. God re reopened her womb later. He salvaged her. You know, and so Job's physical pain and Job's loneliness was not just for a week, not just for a month, nine whole months. He did not become a grumbler or a complainer after nine months of hell on earth, pain in your body. Who knows how long? I mean, it doesn't say the wife said it again, but she might have had that look on her face for a few more months. Who knows? I'm sure he had no sex for nine months. He's got boils all over his whole body. And, um, you know, he, he did God's commandments. He obeyed God's commandments. How do you, how do you learn God's commandments? Uh, same way, uh, Shem was still alive. Shem knew it from his daddy Noah. Japheth went to Europe. Ham went down to Egypt and Africa. Japheth is Middle East and Asia. That's, that's where this seed went out. The Job was out of that there. Shem was still alive. Who did he learn to judge from? Either Shem directly or Shem's sons, disciples. They're still on the earth. Check the timeline. It's still there. It's possible because of the Tower of Babel and the languages. He may have to use an interpreter when he went to see a different high judge of that area, you know. But Shem was alive. And Shem never backslid. Japheth didn't backslid, so Shem was doing God's law. So they said, yeah, murderers put him to death. Genesis 9-6. And the second reason he obeyed um, uh, is because he had the law of God written on his heart. Just like everybody on the planet has the law of God written on their heart. Because you're made in God's image. Okay? So, you, you know, the law of God's written in the heart. That's why you have a conscience. That's why your conscience convicts you if you do wrong. That's the law of God in your heart convicting you. Okay? So it's because some people ask, you know, just so you know, Job was after the flood and Job was before Abraham. Okay? But Job... 99% was the same time alive as Abraham because Shem's son was alive when Abraham was born. Okay? On the timeline. Um, and so some people ask, well, what about the people before the cross? What happened to them? Well, some went to heaven, some went to hell. <laughs> what happened to the people before Moses? You know, before the, the, the commandments in given, because most people answer the commandments and all that. They could become grafted and become a Jew. What happened to people before Moses? Oh, you mean like um, Noah and Job? They're before Moses and uh, Abraham? How about they followed the law of God written on their heart, their conscience, the best of their ability, and those that were perfect, like you need to be, got to go to heaven. Now they had to hang out in Abraham's bosom and wait for the blood of Jesus, but those that were perfect, like you need to be, it's all about bringing them back to them. They're all trying to find an excuse for God when they ask, what about the people before the cross? Well, there's your answer. You know, and, and I'm sure there was only a small remnant of them. From Adam to Moses, I think it was only a remnant. In the Moses' time, it was a remnant. In Elisha's time, it was a remnant. Today, it's a remnant. So I think uh, Job is definitely in the big, 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 big minority, not the majority. It's always been a remnant. It always will be, and that's just the way it is. Uh, chapter 42, verse 7. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Elipaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Elipaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, went and did according as the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job. They went and they did that. They said, wow, he's a servant. He spoke right. The Bible says Job spoke right. That means he was perfect. Okay, When he repented earlier, he just repented of his mind of even questioning God. Not that he was in sin because God said he's perfect. And then God said here he didn't speak anything wrong. Okay, And um, so you think it's over yet? You think there's no more test? No, it's not over yet. Verse 10, another test. Another test. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job 
when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. When he prayed for his ten friends. Those are not, these guys are very annoying for nine months. Okay? Before he gets the double, he has to pray for his friends. Do you still pray for your enemies to get saved? Do you still pray for those that have slandered us to get saved? Do you still pray for those that have got us locked up, falsely accused, spit on us to get saved? I do. I do. I pray for them. I, I want those ones saved. I do. I, I, so it's hell is serious. Hell is that serious. Hell is eternal. And God knows which ones are reprobates. Some of those enemies are reprobates. Yeah, I pray God kills them kills those false teachers that are reprobates. Absolutely. God knows which ones they are, and he's going to kill them in his timing, so I'm not worried about it. But my heart has to be right that I say, yeah, I, I pray you, those ones that slander, those ones that lie, and those that, yeah, I pray they get saved. Take them low. Break their kneecaps. Let them lose their job. Let them get cancer. Whatever it takes, whatever button's going to happen, divorce, adultery, you know, more crazy, yeah, let them, let them, let them, let them get saved. Humble them, Lord. Humble them so they can get saved. Not humble them to be mean, so that's the end of that. No, humble them so they can get saved. Yeah. Do you pray for your enemies? Daniel chapter, uh, well, you know, you know what? I just got a lot of notes on Daniel. I don't think I even got to go to Daniel. All right, let me give you five, six points about Daniel. He was a forced eunuch. People don't realize that. When you get a captive of war and you're in the palace, they chop your balls off. That man's a eunuch. He never reproduced, so therefore he never got married. He had forced loneliness. You know, uh, there was not a lot of them in the palace. And we know Ratchak, Meshach, and Abednego, but, you know, they weren't always together later throughout life in there. So he had forced loneliness. Uh, when he rose up in civil ranks later, I have zero doubt that some of the Jews were jealous of him and separated from him and slandered him because jealousy and envy never goes away. It's always been there. So there is even more that would be like, oh, that's Daniel. He's, he's, he's one of them now. You know, or he's to think she's too good, or he's this, or he's that, even though he's helping them behind the scenes and everything else. Okay? Um, that'll happen to you, too, over time. God blesses you. Number three, it's very, very interesting. I missed this for many years. But Ezekiel and Daniel were contemporaries. They're alive at the same time. So that means when you read Ezekiel 14, 14, his, he's, Daniel saw his own name on the list. <laughs> Can you imagine that? You get the letter of Ezekiel, you know it's scripture, and you're like, oh, this, you're reading it, and he literally says, Noah, Job, and me, Daniel. And he doesn't get one ounce of pride. That's like how Moses wrote, I'm the meekest man on earth. <laughs> you know? Didn't get 1% of pride. And that would puff up a lot of different people. Wow. So he was alive at the same time, and he read his own name on the list. I, 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 the Lord is good. He showed me that. I said, wow, that's good. Uh, four, he stood up when he was a young man. They was like, you need to eat this bad meat sacrificed to idols. And he said no, when he was young. He might have been 15 because I. Teenagers, kids, will you stand up? When the civil to the civil authorities when you're young. Yeah. I don't like those Orthodox Jews, but I don't like those Zionists even worse. There's 10% of them in Israel that are Orthodox and 90% that are homo-hugging Zionists. An Orthodox protest the Zionists and they get their 16-year-old teenager boys that go out there by the hundreds and straight up block downtown traffic at rush hour and jack them all up and they get arrested by the scores. YouTube and watch that video. Yeah. They teach them to disobey the civil authority, take the punishment, and they don't care if they do. If they are on their arrest 15, 15 times. They've been arrested by the time they're 18. Most of them aren't going to work, work in that other field anyway. They know they're the Orthodox Jews. They expect that. And sometimes they get beat by the people in cars, and sometimes they get you know, manhandled by the cops hard, and they just straight up go out there and stop the whole traffic. You know, and they do these protests month after month, protesting their own government. How much more us that are actually saved? I'm so proud of my daughter in Houston. I won't give the story on the camera. But you know what she did in front of a car. That's right. Well, we will lay down our life. We're on, we're on mission. Do, you, do your kids have your spirit? Or do your kids have the spirit of uh, 
Veggie Tales and SpongeBob SquarePants. Okay. All right. I think Veggie Tales is good for little kids. Learn some true pietism. Okay, but then uh, uh, not, not not when they're 12 years old now. Number five. So he stood up when he was young. Number five. He stood up when he was very old. He talked to his new civil rulers as a man to a man. The new king as a man of God to a regular man, and he you know he endured till the end. He endured until the end. And the, and the old quote is, it's not how you start, it's how you finish that counts. Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, you know, a little bit more on that quote. That quote is very good and true for people to get saved as teenagers as an, or as an adult. But you know what? It does matter how you start. <laughs> it surely matters how a child starts. In a race... And they shoot the gun, and they're going to run a mile or 100 yards. If you have a bad start, it is a lot harder for you to finish in first place. It matters how you start. Look who raised Noah. Somebody good daddy out there. Who raised Job? Some good daddy out there. Who raised Daniel? Some good Jewish daddy out there. Solid foundations is probably one reason why they were able to rise so far and endure so much. Because their nameless fathers did the right thing. No one was looking. So I still, you know, like the quote. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. So that, that's good for us to get saved over, like me and you and you and you. But for your kids, no, it matters how you start. There's a reason why your parents do what they do and have the structure to do and the flow they do. And why you, later you'll be like, I need to do that with my kids too. Yeah, you will. It does matter how you start. And uh, number six, last one here. On Daniel, the king bowed before him. Nebuchadnezzar bowed before him, and he didn't get any pride at all. Imagine back in, I, you know, if Biden was before me, I would probably just pray he just dies on public TV. But back when Trump was at his height, if he came through Philly and came to Pastor Aiden and said, somehow we, we ran in and I was street preaching a thing, and he came out from security, and he goes, you're right, he just bows before me. It bows before you, bows before this guy, that guy. 99% of people get to their head. Daniel's like, oh, okay, whatever. You're not the king. The king is king. I interpreted it. <laughs> this is going to happen next. And then he just kept on flowing. Yeah, you talk about overcoming gold, glory, and girls. That's some glory right there because Nebuchadnezzar was way more than Trump ever was. He's beyond even probably Nero and those guys. He was the power of the world. Bowing to him. Didn't move him an inch. Not 1% pride got in there. Yeah. And he, over, he overcame all the same three temptations that were in the wilderness for Jesus Christ. All three of these men came over the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Noah, Job, Daniel. And I don't think they were bad civil rulers at all. I think Noah when he was the civil ruler, was the perfect balance of law and grace. And Job, when he was the civil ruler, was perfect balance of law and grace. And so, you know, the other ones, like I said, we don't know why they're not on the list, but they're powerful men of God. Moses struck the rock. David did adultery. Samuel blew with his kids. Jeremiah, not quite sure, you know, maybe, maybe he, because he got a little discouraged at one time, you know. But all those guys I just named are way head and shoulders above me, above you, above us. You know? to, to even hang with Jeremiah for a day would be awesome. You know? And so they're way above us. But you know, we want to learn from people's mistakes and successes. And these are the three that we don't see any mistakes. Just success after success after success. And they are God's top three. Uh, because they followed the footsteps of Jesus Christ, their Lord, that they had a relationship with. Now, everybody talking about personal relationship. They had personal relationships with God in the Old Testament, people. God spoke to Daniel, then gives him a dream. Then out. God spoke to Noah and said, I'm going to do this. Now, here's how you build it. You have to have a relationship with somebody to give them that detail of a plan, how to build that big of an ark. They had relationship with Jesus Christ. So they learned how to do all this through the Word of God, through the Spirit of God, through the relationship of God. Jesus Christ is our number one example. That is what all these three point to, is the Lord Jesus Christ. They are reflections of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was lonely on the cross, like how Job was lonely when his wife abandoned him and his kids are dead. 
Jesus Christ never married like Daniel was never allowed to marry. Jesus Christ had to rebuke his own family, rebuked his own brothers before, while Noah was rebuking his son. Jesus Christ is our number one example. He's our one to emulate. He's the one that died for us. He rose from the dead and gave us power. Amen. Every head bowed. Everybody praying.